As we quickly approach Boulder Community Health's 100th anniversary in 2022, I often reflect what has been accomplished over our long history. Literally thousands of people have been part of BCH during those decades of growth and development. Different eras, different challenges, but all sharing a fervent belief that our community wants and deserves a health system that reflects and supports Boulder values. All recognizing that the key to being Boulder is being independent. Maintaining our independence has not gotten any easier. Today's challenges include constantly changing federal and state regulations, incredible financial pressures from payers, relentlessly rising costs. Yet the BCH Board of Directors remains confident in our ability not just to survive, but thrive. This has been made possible through the Foundation, our physicians, nurses, and many others who choose to do this work each day across BCH. Your support of the BCH Foundation allows us to invest in high quality medical care, pursue opportunities to evolve and innovate, and to lead with advancements in healthcare. This work is fueled by the deep bench of champions throughout the community who advocate for us in so many different ways. Whether it's investing in expanding access to critical services or igniting partnerships in support of our vision, the BCH Foundation has successfully catalyzed the generosity, advocacy, and talent of the community to support the personalized care that truly makes us unique amongst our peers. Thank you for all that you do to make this work possible. Your investment in the future of Boulder Community Health is making a difference. I want to thank you for joining us and for your support of BCH and the BCH Foundation, which, by the way, um, is supporting not only this event tonight, the BCH Foundation, but is also supporting the grant for us to become um, a affiliate of the Watson Caring uh, Science Institute, as well as helping support our staff be able to go to uh, their um, training to be Caritas coaches. So we deeply thank the BCH Foundation and your community support for us being able to really bring the caring science to here at BCH. So again, I, I'm going to be introducing our distinguished panel tonight that we are going to get into a wonderful conversation about what caring science is, what it means to be an affiliate, what that brings to the BCH community and to our Boulder community. And we're gonna hear some wonderful and inspiring stories and outcomes from our friends and partners at, at Stanford Health, which is one of the premier, as you all know, probably academic medical centers in the country. And they have such great stories to tell us about where we can also go here in Boulder with caring science and creating an environment by which we can achieve the triple aim. So not only patient outcomes, patient satisfaction, financial satisfaction for our patients, but also that deep satisfaction of our caregivers at BCH. So again, I am going to introduce this distinguished panel that I have with me tonight. So first of all, um, and, and uh, it is such a uh, deep honor to be introducing to all of you, Dr. Jean Watson. And Dr. Jean Watson is not only the founder and uh, current director of the Watson Caring Institute, but she is also a Boulder resident. And so she has lived in Boulder for many years, and we are so thrilled to be an affiliate connected with her institute at this point. Um, but Dr. Watson also has a deep roots here in Colorado. So she is a distinguished professor and Dean Emeritus of the University of Colorado Denver College of Nursing at the Anschutz Medical Center, where she did hold the nation's first endowed chair in caring science for 16 years. She is wild, wildly published and she is well known in the nursing profession. 
Um, I call her um, and her body of work, she is a living legacy, or I can also use the word, I looked up some thesaurus words today to see if I could figure out a way to describe Jean, um, but she's an icon, she's a sage in the profession of nursing. And her theory on human caring has been taught in university settings, um, in uh, many advanced practice nursing programs um, a, a, across the world. And so it is, again, it is such a deep honor to have her a part of this panel tonight and to be able to share with you um, what, what we're doing here at BCH um, in, the, in the coming months. A second, I have the distinguished pleasure of introducing Dr. Dale Beatty um, from Stanford Health. So Dr. Beatty is the chief nurse executive and the vice president at Stanford Healthcare. And again, we talked about that being one of our premier academic medical centers in the United States, as well as he leads the flagship hospital at Stanford University. He has a wealth of experience, over 20 years as a chief nursing officer. He has um, worked in many high-performing organizations, and much of that due to his leadership in those organizations. He has extensive experience on boards. He works a lot with some of our quality healthcare organizations that really give us the seal of approval in healthcare, such as the Malcolm Baldrige National Quality Award, as well as a, a nursing-specific award called the Magnet um, Award. Um, he has a BSN from Ohio Westland University and a master's of science and a doctor of nursing practice from the University of Illinois. So he, um, again, a very accomplished um, man who is going to, again, share some just outstanding stories with you about their experience at Stanford. And then our next distinguished guest tonight is Dr. Griselle Hernandez. And she also is at Stanford Health. She is the executive director for education and professional development. She has over 20 years of experience in the uh, professional development area. She again has, like uh, uh, Dr. Beatty, has worked extensively in um, quality um, organizations where she has helped achieve magnet status as well as the Malcolm Baldrige o National Award. She is an adjunct faculty for the Watson Caring Science Institute and a founding member of a regional caritas consortium between New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania and California. She really has been the one that has operationalized and integrated the plan of Watson's caring science theory into practice, into the education, into leadership and research at Stanford Healthcare. She has a BSN from the University of Pennsylvania, a master's of public health from UCLA, and just recently a PhD in nursing from our University of Colorado and at Anschutz Medical Campus. She has done much research specifically in the area of caring science. So we are so pleased to have Griselle with us as well. And then last but certainly not least, our very own uh, Sarah Wise. And so Sarah is our manager of clinical education and practice here at BCH. She is, as you saw from the introductions um, that were sent out, a wealth of experience here in our, in our Boulder Community Health. And I will tell you, she is one of the most compassionate um, individuals, not only with the patients that she still cares for, but also with our staff. She has um, really made a huge impact here at BCH on quality improvement activities. She's been the driving force um, during COVID last year, or I guess it's still going on during our pandemic, but when it was rapidly changing um, our practice standards, she created innovative approaches, really helped our staff be able to really understand what the change was, how to incorporate it into the practice. And she is one of our key change agents in general here at BCH. She also leads many of our activities around diversity, inclusion, and equity at BCH as well. So thank you, Sarah, for, for joining us as well tonight to help share our, um, our experience here at BCH. So I am gonna get the conversation started, first of all, with Dr. Watson. And uh, Dr. Watson is going, what, what is Caring Science Institute? What is that? here in Boulder, uh, what, does meaning, what does being a, an affiliate mean? And why in the world should BCH become an affiliate? What does it bring to our patients and our community? 
Well, as we all know, and thank you again for the privilege of being here and sharing this wonderful occasion. And thank you to the Boulder Community Health Board. And I love the idea. You know, I've, I've spoken before at your um, sessions for Nurses Week, and I've made a point of it, acknowledging that when you, you change the name from Boulder Community Hospital to Boulder Community Health is a significant turn in terms of what we represent and what the community is asking for now in terms of models of caring and healing and health and wholeness and well being that really embraces the whole person and whole systems. So the Institute was created it's about 14 years now that we have been advancing these uh, models of caring and healing and health by acknowledging that we're evolving in our humanity and we're evolving in our science. And caring science is really uh, giving voice and language to what nurses have always done, but we have not made it a um, systematic kind of acknowledgement or a framework by which we hold the values and make explicit the values, the philosophical orientation toward humanity. The fact that we deal with all the complexities of humanity, which is a different, uh, human science is different from medical science because we deal with all the vicissitudes of our humanity and our human experiences. And these are the phenomena that nurses work with. And of course, then we also are acknowledging the needs for the nurse to be, how do we sustain these values of caring and healing and health and altruistic human service? So we go back to Nightingale as the roots of our, our history and really bring it forward. And it, you know, it takes about a hundred years, they say, for a profession to mature and come of age in its own right. So you know, we're at that critical turning point of maturing nursing with this own distinct knowledge and paradigm that balances and complements the finest of what medical science has to offer. So that's the, the reason that we started the Institute was because people were coming to me from clinical agencies and hospitals or different parts of the country saying, we, we know this, this is what nursing stands for, but how do we translate this theory into practice? So this theory, this, this institute that builds and further develops the whole model of caring science has a different starting point. The starting point are these core values and the worldview of ethic of belonging, that we all belong to this infinite field that connects us and unites us. And it embraces all the differences and, and all of the uh, diversity as part of our oneness. So that whole uh, origin of caring science brings us to another model of science that really allows for complexities and, and activities that we wouldn't necessarily have if we just stay in the technical medical sense model. So the other thing I wanna say about this is that the Institute and the theory itself has given language. You know, they, there's this quote from John Parsard. He says, if you can name something, you can change the world. And nurses have been practicing caring theory all their life and all the history of nursing, but we have not named it. If you don't have the, the name of your phenomena of what you have to offer to humanity, how can you look at outcomes? How can you begin to document? How can you begin to operationalize this very important foundation for healthcare of caring, healing, and health if we don't have the language to help translate it into outcomes? So the Institute helps to create a whole full circle of knowledge from patient care to, for the practitioner as well as for the patient, the community, the family, and full circle to outcomes. So some of this research that maybe we can get into a little bit later in the conversation, that we now have this partnership with Press Ganey and other hospital organizations that are actually have taken the, the, the language of the CARETAS processes, which are of core the theory, and translated it into measurements that we've worked on and showing outcomes for patients, where patients are actually defining what they mean what we mean by caring and what they need for caring. And that's what we're now addressing as a full circle. So I'll pause at this point. And that, that's one of the reasons why you want to be an affiliate is because we work together then in a community of scholars and practitioners to advance this in the full circle of, of knowledge and theory and philosophy and values, and ethics and research and outcomes. 
Thank you, Jean. Um, one of the things I'm going to have Sarah follow up with now is what Jean was just describing. Can you talk, Sarah, about why the clinical practice committee here, the nursing clinical practice committee here at BCH is so excited to bring in um, the care test coaching and that education and spreading that across the BCH organization? Uh, yes, and thank you. And and I uh, want to echo Jean's sentiment that I'm, I'm grateful to be here and very grateful to the panelists for taking their time to participate and to talk to us and to our community about what this means to you and how this has transformed um, your care and, and the experience of your patients. And for us at BCH, you know, as Jean said, she, she came to BCH a few times over the last three to five years. And there were several things that she said when she came that really made an impact on us. And one of the things that she said is that nurses carry the sacred covenant with humanity to bring the caring. And for a lot of us, it was such a relief to finally hear our work named and, and to finally have that be understood. And, um, and I, I feel like, you know, telling stories is an effective way of communicating what this is for people. And in this past year and a half, when we've been dealing with the um, pandemic and, and this great, big, huge, scary, chaotic thing that was changing our practice, every day, I mean, multiple times a day, we would have um, updates in our practice to, you know, meet the newest, greatest thing that we understood about this. And to be a nurse that walked into a COVID room in the midst of all that with this person who had the disease that was on the headline of the evening news on every single channel. And to be that nurse with that person in that sacred moment where all we were doing was being present with each other, we were caring about each other. We were reinforcing each other's humanity and vulnerability in that and in comforting that patient and answering questions and meeting their needs, whether that was medication, whether that was hygiene related, whether that was answers to questions or helping them get onto a, a tablet so that they could have some video time with their loved ones. Whatever that was, that connection and recognizing that that's what I'm here for and that's what nursing does renewed me and healed the patient. And that essential connection is what we recognized as wanting to bring to BCH. And especially at this time, you know, if you're any aware at all of the headlines in the news about what's happening in nursing and the burnout that's experiencing and the turnover rates and, and the demand that's happening right now, that caring science is the science that helps us renew by practicing our nursing. Our nursing becomes our practice that fulfills and sustains and renews us. And so it's not that we have to go someplace else. It's that we have a culture and, and a work that we don't need to recover from. It is regenerative for us. And that's what we want our nurses to have. And that's what we want our patients to have is to have that loving experience where their dignity is maintained, where their hope is held up and by people who are um, fully committed to being there and being present with them because that's what nourishes us deeply too. Thank you, Sarah. That was lovely. Um, lovely description of why we are so thrilled um, to be in this position at BCH and learn from others that have been through this journey. So I'm going to turn it over to now to Drs. Beatty and Hernandez. And I really want to um, you all to hear their story of how, how long they've been an affiliate, what that has meant for their organization, what it has meant for their patients, and what it has met, um, meant for their staff as well. So I will turn it over to the two of you. Chris, I'll take the lead. Sure. Hello, everybody. And thank you again for the opportunity to share our experiences with all of you. Um, Stanford Healthcare has been on a uh, caring science journey for almost 20 years. And um, actually, I, I misspoke. It has to be probably about 15 years. And um, it, was, it hasn't been until probably the past um, four years where we have seen a, a full transformation of this work. We became an affiliate of Watson Caring Science uh, Institute in 2015. And Dale came to our organization in 2017. Um, 
the the care, caring science as a theory has been part of our uh, professional practice model um, for a very long time. It uh, kind of came to fruition in 2010. And um, we realized that we wanted to move it away from the, from the piece of paper. We wanted this to be the, the glue, the, the part of the DNA, not only of what it meant to be a nurse here at Stanford, but also a healthcare professional at Stanford. We wanted every single one of our interactions to, um, to be uh, grounded in the work that Jean has worked for the past 40 years. Um, and we realized that the only way that we could do that was to have a very mindful and intentional um, integration of caring science into all aspects of our work in practice and education and research and in our what we call legacy or leadership. Um, and when Dale uh, came uh, to Stanford Healthcare in 2017, we had, if you will, a renaissance of um, what it meant to be a caring science um, organization. And he was instrumental in ensuring that the work that we had already begun really took hold. And he was very intentional in ensuring that caring science as the theoretical framework of our practice was embedded into the strategic initiatives of patient care services. And that kind of helped us flourish and really create uh, infrastructures um, to ensure that the work continues. I wish that I could tell you that we are 100% perfect in this endeavor. Um, but I think that the fact that we are not 100% there gives us the opportunity to really be creative and think of different ways that we can really um, make this work come to life. And I'm going to let him uh, continue the, the, the story so that he can share with you from his um, level um, in with leadership how he was able to help us with that. So thank you, for Griselle, for that introduction. And uh, listen, it's been a journey. And I know, uh, Jackie, thanks for the introduction. And you highlighted this is actually my uh, 20th year as a chief nurse. And what's interesting to me about it is uh, all of us have philosophies of nursing uh, and have our professional practice model. But actually a colleague of Jean's and Grizel actually said to me, how do you actually, Brooke, uh, Brooks uh, actually asked, how do you assure that you're actualizing, kind of living and, and breathing your nursing philosophy within your organization? And it struck me uh, that I had used Jean Watson's uh, Caring Science as a nursing philosophy and, and other organizations that I had been in. But I realized that I didn't necessarily have the full literacy uh, to um, actualize it. Uh, within the organization. So uh, so that hit me. And then Grizel, uh, uh, I just got here and said, you're going to go to San Francisco with us. Uh, we're going to do a little uh, application exercise on caring science, and we're going to paint with watercolors. And I thought, okay, this must be one of those San Francisco things uh, that we do just kind of interesting things. Uh, and I really found myself enjoying it. And what I realized is, um, and then I uh, decided to go into the caring uh, science Caritas coach program to help me get uh, language and, and build competencies so that I could help lead my organization uh, uh, in a stronger way. And so uh, as an outcome, you know, we were uh, been able to, number one, we had our magnet survey just recently, and it ended up being one of our exemplars in terms of how we uh, leverage uh, and apply um, our nursing philosophy, caring science within our organization. And it's, it's really great uh, to see that. And then I know we're going to talk a little bit more about outcomes, but more specifically, yesterday, we actually had one of our managers pass away within our organization. And um, I went to the unit and I uh, was thinking, gosh, how am I going to support the staff and the, and the managers in that area? And hence, we had one of our Caritas coaches that happened to be working that day. And I looked over and she had actually transformed a corner uh, of a lobby uh, uh, and created a sacred space with candles 
and um, uh, meditation and reflection uh, so that individuals could support one another. Uh, and I thought, wow, uh, to actually see it living and breathing and in being practiced, caring science, you know, taking care of self and others in that way was just incredible. So I, I felt very proud of, of that moment. But as Grizel said, it is a journey. Uh, it's something we're always, it is a practice and it's something that you're always working to develop, you, surrounding yourself with others. Uh, Gene has been instrumental in our organization and in the Institute and help us helping us build uh, our caring science program here here at Stanford, um, but you're never done. Um, but I do think um, having theory and a framework uh, that brings meaning to your being and who you are and how you practice is critically important. And uh, Sarah, you mentioned the issue of burnout. And I think that's one of the challenge. We get so busy doing that we forget what the purpose of what it is that we're here to do. And when you think of service, that's why a lot of us got into this uh, into this business was to help one another. And even uh, uh, your community here is looking for ways to transcend and create meaning uh, in, in the relationships that you all have. And I did just want to make one other comment that even though um, we have had application with nursing, it's broader than nursing. Uh, your entire health system, everyone that's participating, including the board, uh, can be champions of caring science. Uh, and I think it's really important that we think about it in that regard, because it's really about transcending and transforming your culture. If I can just add a little bit, you know, I um, when we practice from a caring science um, framework, uh, the, the, the work that we do, whether we are a nurse, a therapist, a social worker, uh, a janitor, um, CEO, CNO, uh, across the system, it really elevates the caring consciousness um, of organizations. And it elevates our work from being task oriented to being sacred. Um, it reminds us to what Sarah said earlier of the sacred covenant that we have with the public to preserve their dignity and to care for them in a way that they want to be cared for. And when our patients are feeling safe and when our patients are feeling cared for, that is the highest level of a, a patient experience that you can possibly be give to another human being. And this work gives us, again, the language to call it out. And not only that, it, it creates an internal landscape where even in the middle of the craziest of, um, uh, of anything that's happening from the pandemic to anything else that could possibly happen, you yourself become the healing environment for that other human being. So, and I can tell you this from a personal, from personal experiences, because I, I have, you know, I've been the recipient of care in other organizations, and I've been the family member of, of patients receiving care in other organizations. And when you are cared for in an organization that has as its foundation caring science, you can feel it. You can palpate it. People are the living expression of that work. That was beautifully said, Chriselle, thank you. I, and, I, and I do believe um, all of us would say that nursing, as Jean pointed out, has had caring at the center of the profession since Florence Nightingale, maybe before, but Florence really is kind of our icon of starting our nursing profession. And, so at BCH, we certainly have a lot of compassion and caring, et cetera, with our, our staff, with um, our physicians, you know, that, that, that is not foreign to us. So maybe what I can ask is um, Dr. Beatty to comment a little bit more on as you went through this journey and you really integrated caring science into the, um, into the, to the care, into the professions, into um, how you approached care and how you approached the relationship with each other and with, with themselves. What did that, how did that transform uh, Stanford Health 
from the perspective of what we what we called earlier the industrial measure, yes. measures that we could um, more objectively show the influence and the and the um, objective outcomes that we measure in healthcare. You know, Jackie, thank you for asking that question. It's a really important question. And, you know, all of us have metrics that we're focusing on as well. But one of the things that I, I noticed in, in my career, and actually Gene helped me with this through uh, mentorship and education as well, is that sometimes we get so focused on the metrics and again, the doing that we lose the framework or the context of what it, why, what it is that who we are and, and what our purpose is. And I think it's really important to start with that. And I can say we focused on getting our Caractas coaches up and running uh, and uh, supporting our uh, health system uh, with um, advancing our philosophy of caring science. And uh, from my experience in doing that, really working on the culture and the transformation, the metrics have taken care of themselves. Uh, because it has brought purpose uh, to the individuals providing care in the relationship. So I'll be real concrete. Our patient satisfactions moved from the 80th percentile all the way up into the highest uh, 90th uh, percentiles. Uh, so we're, we're leading uh, in uh, satisfaction at Stanford Healthcare. You know, our financial performance uh, has been uh, really strong. We continue to have anywhere between a five to 10% margin uh, uh, yeah, as a health system. So the finances have taken taking care of themselves as well. Our engagement uh, of our employees has gone up. In fact, that's a requirement for Magnet that you're above the national mean. We're well above the national mean. And we've dropped our nursing turnover from 14.1% uh, to 7% in a three year period through our journey of caring science. And I think it's because we're creating a healthy practice environment um, that brings meaning to those that are practicing in it and to the patients that are experiencing it. So I think those outcomes speak for themselves. And so, so many times people say to me, well, you're lucky that you're able to invest in caring science. And I always say it's the other way around because we've invested in caring science and uh, our culture, we have these outcomes. Uh, and uh, I think it's important for um, to be able to demonstrate outcomes, sure, um, but I think it's more important to develop a healthy uh, practice environment that creates meaningful relationships between one another uh, and bringing purpose to the work that people do, uh, because I think people want to do a great job. They come to work with great uh, um, ideas of supporting, and sometimes we get in the way with some of the things that we do in our task orientation, so I think it does bring meaning and purpose, but I, I think our outcomes do speak for ourselves, and I, I think it's important for all of us to be able to articulate that. So I don't have any problem with getting any support at this particular point for caring science initiatives within our organization. In fact, our CEO has come to some of our rounds and participated uh, with a singing bowl uh, in some of our caring science activities. And I definitely think through COVID, you know, we're hearing about people leaving the workforce, nurses leaving the workforce post-COVID, and we're, we are having the opposite experience. Uh, and in fact, our COVID units actually had the highest satisfaction of all of our units, both from an engagement perspective. And some of it was we really focused on the safety uh, the listening, uh, you know, of what, what the staff really wanted, uh, and also the resource and the support as well. So uh, uh, that's really an important. We measure uh, meaningful relationships. I see a comment in the chat. Uh, Jean mentioned that she has collaborated at the national level with several vendors, uh, most recently with Press Ganey. And we, uh, in that, we have inserted language uh, into the survey um, that uh, does quantify uh, those relationships. So, you know, uh, was I treated with respect and dignity? Uh, in the past, we were looking at how fast did I respond to a call light? Uh, and when you put that metric up and everyone's been really busy, it doesn't mean a lot to a practicing nurse, you know, to say, really, I didn't get to the call light a minute earlier. Uh, it's not that it's not important. It doesn't bring meaning to their own practice uh, as it does. You know, we had a respectful and meaningful relationship. So we do quantify it and we do measure it. And we know here at Stanford Healthcare, there's a strong correlation between the caring si science questions in the survey with our likelihood to recommend. Thank you so much for that question, Jane. And I will add that we also asked that question on our own patient satisfaction 
surveys that go out to our patients as well. And so we have started to do that, I believe, Sarah, in November of 2019. And so we are just starting to look at the trends in that data and um, what it's telling us in relationship to what Dr. Beatty just uh, commented on as well. The only other thing I would add, and then I'll uh, leave it to my colleagues, is that we also have, we also participate in the National Database for Nursing Quality Indicators, and we are able to measure our relationships RN to RN, RN to MD, uh, and RM to other disciplines. And so we are way above the national average in those as well. So uh, our, our physicians are saying they appreciate and enjoy working with our nurses and vice versa. And our nurses are saying they enjoy working with uh, and have meaningful relationships with one another. Thank you for sharing that. That's another really great uh, measure or, or indicator of really integrating the caring science into all of the relationships that we have within healthcare. I don't know, it looks like Jean, maybe you'd like to add something. Uh, you're on mute, Jean, just to unmute. I love this conversation. And I just wanted to highlight uh, the measurement aspect because we've taken the 10 care task processes that people may or may not know, but I'll just highlight five of them that are used as a measurement. And we have them not only for patients, but we have them for the nurse to measure herself or assess herself, as well as colleagues and the leadership. So we get a whole full circle of uh, data from the culture perspective. But the five items that are incorporated in these measurement tools are asking patients, as well as the other aspects, was your care delivered with loving kindness? So, you know, care toss brings caring and love together for health and healing. So, you know, it brings that to full life in a measurement. Was your care delivered with loving kindness? You know, it was kind of heretical. But if you start asking patients, that's really a beautiful um, question to ask them. The second question is, um, did you have a helping relationship with your practitioner? Did you have, were your basic needs met with dignity? Did you experience a healing environment? And were your values and beliefs honored? So all of these are really um, cross sections of how you take the theory and move it into a measurement and, and then relate it to the, the humans. So you're humanizing the system and you're bringing a full circle of knowledge. That, and one of the hospitals we're working with, which is an interesting model of how they use this data, they, um, they don't give their staff nurses feedback on the HCAP scores. They give them feedback on the care toss items because that's their professional practice model. So that's what they get is feedback to help them change their practice or see what they need to do to improve their practice is related to that, not these industrial measures that you get from the HCAP scores. So I find that kind of a fascinating kind of term too, how to make this really useful. So it's not just you know saying you're, you're practicing caring, but how do you live it out and how do you actualize it? And then how do you have evidence of it? So it's new forms of evidence we're asking for. Thank you, Jean, for that. Um, maybe I'm going to I'm going to ask this question to Grissel. Um, it, the question is is Can you give us some specific examples of how you really drove that operate operate? I can't even say the word of driving it into the practice um, of the caring science framework. So, what are some like really tangible actions that um, are now different at Stanford Health than they were prior to that? Mm -hmm. Um, so as the, you know, one of the things that caring science does is that puts a, one of those assumptions that we have is that caring is relational and it occurs in four different uh, relationships that we have, the relationship with ourselves, relationship with our colleagues, our patients, and our community. And one of the things that we did, especially myself as the director of um, our professional development um, department, that we decided that caring science was going to be foundational in the way that we were creating educational activities for our staff, including the training and onboarding of new staff. Um, and in 2018, I believe, we went from having a general just nursing orientation to having a general 
clinical orientation where every clinician, um, with the exception of um, our doctors, because they're not part, um, they're not hired uh, by Stanford Healthcare, come and do orientation together, our clinical orientation. So um, caring science became the way that we created um, orientations. We present it the way that we design the room so that it was relational, not classroom um, way. It was more reflective. It was more about bringing and acknowledging the lived experiences and the work experiences that they brought from other organizations and setting expectations of what it meant to be a professional, a clinical professional here at Stanford and practicing through caring science. So that we created that infrastructure. During COVID, um, one of the things that um, Dale uh, um, supported was one of our Caritas coaches, basically her work during our COVID um, experience and time was to come to, our, uh, to the different units. She created aromatherapy rollers and she went around and she did caring rounds. She asked staff and anybody, how are you doing? What can we do for you? And she just that simple interaction during their workday of um, connecting with them at a heart level and providing them the opportunity to decompress for a little bit. If they were into aromatherapy, she gave them the rollers and it was a hit. It was a success to do that. And uh, in addition to that, we were also um, very, um, another thing that Dale has done, and I'm sorry that this is going to become the Dale uh, marathon of greatest hits, but it has been so inspiring to see somebody at his level to really um, believe in this work and help us um, identify resources to do this. Something else that he has done is that he identified, we have one, um, we, which his title is Nursing Professional Development Specialist. His name is Ali. And part of his work is to ran on our staff and to support their mental health. He is a mental health um, a, a nurse practitioner. And he has been able to go and do um, debriefings and just being available. And that is his gift. And he's been able to do that with the support of Dale and um, his manager. Um, so those are some of the simple, they might seem simple, uh, but they're profound. And these are things that are continuing. I definitely think, um, I, I know that uh, the our transformation and the patient experience is embedded from the caring science. Uh, and now we're working on the next generation. In fact, we're sending some of our patient experience folks to the next Caritas uh, uh, program so that they become, you know, I was speaking to, to Gene a little bit about this before, you know, uh, we have what we call, which is great, we have a program called CI Care for patient experience, but it isn't grounded or on the foundation of theory. Um, and so now we're trying to merge and provide the uh, foundation of theory uh, to the work that we do in CI care. So that's going to be our next generation of work. And so we have a couple of uh, individuals from our patient experience team, non-nurses, that will go and get the, the, the literacy and the competencies uh, for, for Caritas. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. I think some other things I might add from, you know, the history of this work uh, in hospitals are the ways that nurses actually um, change from doing to being and creating safe space where they actually support each other. And they do very concrete things. I mean, it's almost like rituals uh, where they actually it's about self-care, but they stop mid-step or mid-sentence when they're most rushed and hurried and just breathe. They fall into their heart center and bring up compassion. They pause before they enter the patient's room. They pay attention to these concrete acts such as hand washing, which is not just for infection control as important as that is, but it's also self-cleansing and it's a way for them to uh, inter intentionally um, bless and release the last person so they can be more present to the next person. And so all of these very concrete practices are examples of the ontology of being human. And that's what I think this theory advances and brings caring and love back together and 
the energy of love as part of a healing model. And it brings in all of the ways of knowing in the indigenous cultures as well as their most contemporary science. So it's really quite an evolved view that incorporates the whole. You know, I, I wanted to comment too, Jean, you made me think about it. I mean, all the work that we're doing on um, equity, you know, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, this, uh, uh, these competencies and this science really helps with that, creating a space of understanding, of listening uh, as well. I see some comments about equity and access. I mean, using it uh, to help transform your organization, because we all have ways, things that we could do better. There's no question about that. Uh, but uh, using the science uh, uh, and the language can really help you in that effort. So I know we're doing quite a bit of work here in diversity, equity, inclusion, and health equity. You know, it came up heavily, I think, during the COVID uh, time period in terms of who, acts, who has access to testing, who has access to um, vaccine uh, and making sure that we're, we're leveraging that to the best of our ability because we're uh, Stanford Health, we're an academic medical center, but we're also a community hospital. We're here for our, our community and we want to make meaningful com uh, connections with our community. So I think that would be another way I would offer in terms of that it's been meaningful and, and transformative. All right, so Sarah, I'm going to ask you to just maybe comment on, especially as, as Jean mentioned, rituals and um, some of the ways we've even started looking at how we care for each other and how we care for ourselves as we went through COVID. Um, and some of this is actually on display at the Boulder Museum here in town. Yes, thank you. We um, have done several rituals. The Nurse Practice Council um, has brought several rituals to the organization. And during COVID, what we did was we had at the employee entrance, we had this beautiful ritual table um, that our chaplains helped to, to build and it had um, rocks. And so these were our foundation stones. And the foundation stone was something, you know, it was a piece of the earth that, that we could carry with us in our pocket and it could simultaneously absorb the anxiety that we wanted to discharge at the end of the day, but it also reminded us of our grounding and our foundation in caring. And as you walked out at the end of the day, we would drop these stones into this large, beautiful bowl. And then at the end of the week, we took those stones and with all the anxiety and everything that we wanted to release and to the back of the um, hospital's property where there's a beautiful creek and we released the stones into the creek so that all of that could just be um, washed away and, and, and you know taken in the current. And then most recently, um, since COVID, we had um, two rituals where again, at the, at the employee entrances, we had uh, little packets of seeds and people could pick up the seeds. And these were seeds of renewal and seeds of hope. And again, you carried them with you for however long, an hour, a day, a week. And, and you would just imbue them with everything that you wanted to grow and bloom. You know, it was springtime. We, you know, we're coming out a little bit from the COVID season. You know, the, the sun's starting to shine. The days are a little bit longer. So whatever it is that you want to bloom in the coming days and months and years. And so you would imbue those into the seeds. And then as you left, you would drop the seed the seeds into this bowl and then at the end of the week we did a um, ritual blessing of them and then we planted them over by the courtyard um, outside of our cafe where our staff um, enjoy our delicious meals and then we also at that same ritual table had little pieces of paper where you could write down the things that you were done with things you did not want to bring with you from the past year and you know, grief, fatigue, overwhelm. And you put those into this little box and then we dug this huge hole in um, what's becoming our Caritas garden. It is our um, meditation garden that is um, a somewhat secluded area on the campus that's very accessible to staff throughout the day. And uh, we put all of those things that we were done with in that hole and then we planted a service berry tree. And the service berry tree is known for its beautiful blooms and but also for its deep roots and its ability to um, survive terrible storms, harsh weather, inclement conditions. And the name of course, service berry um, really does speak to our work. And um, we 
put those the things we were done with in that hole to turn into compost to nourish the roots um, that will sustain us and thrive and grow and bloom. And so um, those are some of the rituals. Um, and and we have a very relational culture. Relationship is one of the core values at BCH, and it is the way that um, we do business. And so we also recognize that that's one of the strengths that we um, are building on by bringing more and more of the caring science work. And we have incredibly supportive and innovative um, support staff, um, especially with our, our chaplains and our support services team um, that do a lot of this kind of work that you're talking about with rounding and bringing different elements um, to staff and, and really nutritious food. The community was incredibly grateful um, to bring um, nutritious food to us at the bedside, you know, in the middle of a shift um, throughout the pandemic. And that even still continues um, uh, today, you know, as, as the pandemic's winding down. So those are a few of those things. Um, yeah, I was thinking, I was, I, I, I was thinking as, I, as I was listening to all the things that you're talking about and what Dale was um, sharing, other um, very practical ways that we've been able to integrate caring science um, have been, we we have, some of our units have, um, we call them Zen rooms, but they're renewal rooms. We also have um, uh, meditation um, uh, posters by, um, right in front of our hand washing stations to kind of remind us to what Jean said earlier of that intentional pause and, and really centering our staff to move uh, to begin and to close the caring experience that they had with one patient so that they can move to the next patient. We also had, we, we were very lucky as well to have um, uh, community members who donated um, monies for us so that we could have food for our staff during the COVID months. And that was very uh, appreciative. And I'm looking at some of the comments on the chat and, you know, I, I know what it feels to be um, a patient that is not heard um, or a family member that is not heard um, in organizations that perhaps they're trying to do their best um, with what they have in front of them. And one of the things that I have appreciated from, the, um, from practicing from a caring science perspective is that it gives you um, it gives you the opportunity to really be in relation with another human being and feel their pain. Even if you don't understand it, just to be with them and with their pain and with their suffering. And together, um, as, a uh, uh, as a team, working on identifying the best way to support people. And sometimes the only way that we can support each other is by listening and by acknowledging our suffering. And, you know, there isn't, I, I wish that I could say that this will solve all the world's problems. Um, but I think that what it does is that it opens our hearts and it cracks our hearts open so that we can listen to the suffering of another human being and together come up with, some creative solutions so that we can be there for them. Well, well, the only thing I would add to that is sometimes it's, uh, I hear people use language like these are soft uh, skills. And, uh, you know, I push back on that pretty heavily. It's like, no, these are core competencies uh, that's required in a professional practice environment. Uh, and so the skill sets that are acquired uh, through uh, understanding and developing these competencies can help transform uh, your organization. But it is a practice to Griselle's point. We always have to continue to refine and build and grow uh, just as individuals and as a health system. Love, love this conversation. This is so, so fun to, to hear and to really get excited about all of the things that we can incorporate here at BCH. There are a few questions that I think we're going to move to since we're getting close to time here. Uh, I don't know, Sarah, if you want me to ask uh, um, them or if you have them in front of you. Um, well, there was one, one question that jumped out to me that I, I just think is a really great question. And that is, can you give some, some examples of specific things that you changed as a result of this science? 
And I'm wondering if that's a question about some specific changes that from the patient perspective. So, you know, from the perspective of being in the bed, what what is, feels, looks different from that perspective? So I think we touched on some of that in our discussion. I mean, I, I re we really did transform our patient experience environment. And part of it, and Griselle touched on it just now when she was talking about it, we actually on a, on a regular basis create um, patient advisory councils, patient family advisory councils. And we, uh, for the purpose of um, hearing, listening and getting feedback actively. And so then of course, using your Caritas competencies and caring science to help create understanding uh, and uh, is critically important. So that, that's kind of in the DNA of how we work now. Uh, and it really has helped us to accelerate um, our overall performance uh, and, and our experience as well. And I also think uh, you know, during COVID, we leveraged our Kiritos coaches in a, in a major way to make sure that we were supporting our staff and we'll continue to do that as well to build resist, uh, resilience and support for them in the work that they do uh, because it is hard and heavy. And we're just now starting to figure out what some of the post-traumatic um, results will be from working in this environment. We all know trauma was a, was uh, experienced, uh, and I saw separation of family and um, uh, patients was one of them. You know, moral distress was really high, uh, and making sure we were making meaningful connections in that regard. I think Griselle mentioned Ollie that went out and about and worked with staff and family members on that. We also tried to leverage technology to uh, like iPads so that we can make sure that we can connect family and patients to the best of our ability. Uh, so, and part of that, all of that was rooted out of, out of caring science, you know, wanting to make sure that we continued even with physical separation that we were able to connect. I think another, um, I think it's a great example. I think another question that we have uh, or comment um, that maybe we could expand on a little bit between our panelists is there is a, an individual that is working on um, uh, uh, doctoral research with medical teams related to moral injury and also looking at the hierarchical barriers, for example, between nurses being able to speak up to a physician, and that is a hierarchical relationship in our world still, when they might have a safety concern. Um, and when, um, again, it might, uh, physicians might not be inviting that type of feedback or concerns from the nurses. So do, do any of you have any ideas on researching, understanding, operationalizing ways to help both nurses and physicians better manage the normal and natural human factors challenges of these dynamics, of that hierarchical dynamic? Well, I might add something here from a standpoint of um, ethics committees. And you know, often you see the the, the hierarchy in terms of the way uh, institutional review board is reviewing an ethical decision making or a situation. And often the voice of nursing and caring has been silent. And when I've sat on some of those committees at the university, uh, it was quite a, astonishing to me in some instances where Everyone uh, spoke uh, from the medical perspective of the ethical dilemma, but then the nurses were there, but they were silent and I invited them to speak. And it was like two different stories were being presented to the ethics board. And it, what was fascinating to me is that once they were invited, the, the decision making was to actually accept the medical board, the physician's view, until I asked that it maybe needed to be revisited because there were other voices that were not addressed in the decision that was made almost like this is a, a normal outcome. But what was also fascinating to me when I uh, left the room, the nurses came running up to me to tell me the reason that quote, case was even presented to the institutional board is because they had commented, they had, they had critiqued it, and they had presented it to the board. They brought it to the board because it was such an ethical dilemma for them, the way the treatment was. And the other thing that happened was the physician who presented the, the case was the PI on the research to make a case to continue the research. So there's lots of dynamics here going on. And I think part of what I think we're getting to is when nurses have their own voice 
and their informed moral action. And that's one of the things that's happening now. When you have the language to articulate what it is that you're about and what you stand for in terms of the patient and in terms of the perspective that we bring through the ethical view, it's an of ethics of caring and ethics of relationships was very different from biomedical ethics and all that end result kind of thing. So I've studied ethics at the Kennedy Institute. And so, you know, there are really dynamics here that are quite dramatically different. And I think this is their challenge. And when nursing has this voice, then we're able to, to, to speak up and to take action as informed moral action. And I, I would add, we actually have a PhD, uh, a nurse that actually is a Caritas coach uh, and who she ha has done her study um, and work on implicit bias. Uh, and so she's identified and has been working to develop teams to uh, mitigate uh, implicit bias in the way that we interact with one another. And so there was a hierarchical issue that came up where uh, the nursing staff identified where they thought there was racial bias associated with, a, and it was, it was, it was was um, unintentional. Um, and so there was a lot of work. The nursing staff did raise their voice. They, it actually, uh, then we had a chair of surgery that actually had grand rounds on the topic where people could really explore the topic of discussion uh, based on evidence and fact. Uh, and it was a, a really healthy discussion. And I think uh, this individual, this PhD prepared nurse uh, uh, was able, is now developing her uh, nursing staff underneath her uh, to advance in this work uh, so that we're making sure that we're providing um, a healthy uh, environment for everyone. Yeah, the other thing that we have done and I, um, is shift, we're using caring science to shift the way that we're hiring our new nurse residents, our new grads, and we're moving away from just focusing on school and their GPA and how pretty their resume looks or their and things like that and to really look at the whole person and to ensure that who we are hiring is the manifestation of our mission, vision and values for our organization and all the other stuff that we need to teach, we will teach or we will train, but we want to make sure that we have um, staff, especially the new generation of nurses that come with a heightened awareness of caring consciousness and their covenant with our community. So the questions that were, the behavioral questions that we're asking are questions related to caring moments, to the, the experience that, that they learn from, from mistakes or from um, disappointments and how that um, help them become better human beings and things like that. So it's been very transformational for the way that we're hiring people. All right. I am unfortunately have to say we are out of time tonight. This was so wonderful. Um, I can hardly wait um, to continue to share our journey in the caring science um, with our community in the future as well and continue to, to share our partnership and, and learning um, with Stanford Health and with Dr. Watson as we move forward in this journey at BCH. Um, again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for your support of BCH in our community. And um, again, we will answer any questions that we didn't get to on a frequently asked questions document that we will post on our website as well. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and thank you to um, my distinguished panelists here for a wonderful conversation about caring science. Thank you. Blessings. <laughs>